Hi, my name's Matt Bell. I am Port Macquarie Hastings Council's Biosecurity Officer for Invasive Weeds. Thanks for tuning in today to learn a bit more about the topic of biosecurity, what it is and why it's important. Normally, we would uh, have an actual workshop that you'd all come to and we could have a chat. Uh, but this year we've had to adapt uh, and to bring you this online format. So I really appreciate that you've taken the time to uh, watch. Today, you'll see some presentations from uh, on various topics related to biosecurity. Firstly, from myself, uh, I'll be talking about weed management and I'll be chatting to some locals who are active in weed management, which I hope will inspire you to get involved. Next, you'll hear from local land services. Uh, Ella will talk about how small farms can play a key role in biosecurity. And Donna will discuss uh, plant pests and diseases along with invasive ant species. Finally, Mick will uh, chat about vertebrate pests and their management options. Our main message today is that biosecurity is everyone's responsibility. And the first step is to gain a bit more knowledge about how you can play your part in protecting our region from pests and diseases. I hope that you'll take something from today and you'll have further questions. And if so, you can uh, check out the invitation on our website to participate in a live Q&A session via Zoom. This will be on Tuesday the 23rd of June at about 1 p.m. Uh, where myself and the other presenters will be available to answer um, all your questions about biosecurity. So thanks, and I hope you enjoy. All right, g'day. Uh, my name's Matt, and uh, I'm the Biosecurity or Invasive Weeds Officer at Port Macquarie Hastings Council. Uh, thanks for joining us here today in Coolumbung Creek um, to talk about all things weeds and biosecurity. Now, you'll you hear me mention that term quite a bit, biosecurity and priority weeds today. Uh, what you won't hear me mention is the term noxious weeds. Uh, that's because weeds are now managed as part of the Biosecurity Act along with invasive animal pests and diseases. Uh, and this has all replaced the Noxious Weeds Act of the past. So why do we why do we care about biosecurity and weeds? And what is biosecurity? Um, I guess you can say biosecurity in general is something that protects the economy, uh, the ag agriculture, the environment, people from the negative impacts of weeds and pests and diseases. And we care about weeds in particular uh, because they can have a huge impact on our economy, on human health, they impact the price of food, they impact threatened um, plant and animal communities, uh, and native wildlife. Uh, in fact, in areas like this, that once had huge coverings of the uh, weed lantana, they can prevent koalas from moving through the bush and accessing their favourite trees. So there's very practical uh, reasons for getting rid of a lot of weeds. So we all have a responsibility to manage weeds and to know our biosecurity risks. Uh, which brings me to one of my favourite messages is that biosecurity is everyone's responsibility. Now that doesn't just mean uh, council or national parks or big organisations, it, it means all of us. So um, we all have what's called a general biosecurity duty to prevent, eliminate or minimise biosecurity risks uh, or weeds uh, from becoming an issue. So whether or not you're um, a home gardener, a fisherman, a hiker, four-wheel driver, mountain biking, um, any of our activities, whether it's our hobby, our job, um, our lifestyle, all these can have an impact on biosecurity and we all 
need to know or reasonably know what risks our activities can pose. Now in some areas like this, we're lucky enough to have volunteers that come and help, they identify weeds and they help restore the environment. So we've got the Friends of Coolumbung that work in this area. Uh, we've got Rex here with us and um, they do a fantastic job and have done so for many years. Hi Rex. Oh yeah. How you going mate? Good, good. Um, so can you give us a bit of a rundown on just who the Friends of Coolumbung are and just a bit of a general description of what you do? Yeah, Friends of Coolumbung started in the uh, 70s when a group of um, uh, conservationists saw uh, an area and right in the centre of Port Macquarie could be uh, destroyed and made into parking lots, sports grounds and maybe house precincts and uh, those conservationists were very very tough and um, twisted the arms of some of the politicians and got an area made into I think it's called a reserve. Uh, in um, So about I think uh, 19... 82 uh, things were on roll and uh, Friends of Coolumbung started and they had quite a massive group in those days because there was a lot to do. Uh, they looked after I think about 55 hectares of lantana so that was all it was in those days. Um, a lot of the bush that you see nowadays wasn't as advanced as it is, as it is now and uh, mm. so they worked very very hard in uh, groups of probably 20 and even 30. Mm. Uh, now we come to nowadays we do have pockets of um, what we call knockdown areas and these are areas of uh, dense growth of weeds like uh, lantana and privet and um, uh, ochna and uh, senna yeah. and uh, we go in as, as a group and we tend to start at what we call a beginning and just slowly progress uh, north to south or east to west but in a deliberate direction and we're normally working along fence lines or creek edges yep. so we've got a clear direction of where to go. Yeah, fantastic. And yeah, it clearly shows um, in the areas every year they're getting better and better. and Less and less weeds. Of are appearing yeah. over time. It does take uh, a number of years to get the weed seed bank down. Mm. Uh, in our area, because we're right in the middle of um, Port Macquarie, we do get uh, seeds transported from home gardens, which are mainly weeds to us, yeah. uh, and they're transported by the birds, of course, wind, uh, flooding, yeah. uh, and you know, unfortunately, dumping of uh, uh, waste material from gardens. Uh, people use um, native areas to dump rubbish and we don't like that at all. Yes, um, and that's a, a good point in that part of biosecurity is not dumping in bushland areas as it presents a clear problem to volunteers like, like here. Um, so how do you go about training new volunteers and learning about weeds and what do you do if you come across a weed that you don't know? Right. Um, well, up till now, we've had uh, a booklet, which is the Weed Weedwise book, yeah. booklet, uh, which is now online. Uh, so it's uh, an app that you can get for your phone, uh, and that's available for people. But generally, uh, we do take people for a, a walk through the park, showing what the people, uh, the volunteers in the past have done and then we um, uh, give, give them an idea of how the place works as far as getting the, the weeds um, down uh, by our, our aspect. Uh, we do a lot of hand weeding because uh, we find that we don't want to use too much spray in native areas. We don't want the residue of sprays staying in the soil. Uh, the, we don't know but it possibly affects animals and birds and things. So. We do use uh, sprays to a minimum. Uh, hand weeding we do because, say if you have an area of uh, uh, farmer's friends, uh, sometimes you can have you know, 20 by 30 metres of, of one area of weeds. Well, um, 
you can spray them uh, and they will have seeds on, so if you just leave it, those seeds are going to germinate. So what we do is hand weed that area, put them in a big pile, and then all those weeds stay in that pile and break down mm. in the cop composting action. There will be a few weeds around the edge where they come down and germinate around the edge of that pile, uh, but then we can just quickly spray that little area. So we are narrowing the uh, uh, area of where the seeds are germinating. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so when you find, say, a rare weed um, or a new weed, uh, how do you know, how do you make sure that you've got their identification right and right. then how do you learn what you should do to get rid of that weed? Right. Uh, first of all, we've got a very good um, man on board who's a volunteer. He's an ex-National um, Parks Ranger, so he has a great idea of uh, weeds and the native uh, plants that should be in the bush. Yep. Um, on top of that, we have uh, a biosecurity division in the council, and um, uh, with Matt on board, uh, it's easy just to give him a call or send a photograph, and he will identify that photograph or go out with us and see where the uh, plant is and identify it for us or do some research mm. Mm. and that way he knows how to um, deal with it and he'll let us know um, what to do. Yeah, that's great. All right. Um, so we might um, do some demonstration of certain weeds uh, and the techniques that we can use to get rid of them. Within the bushland here we have two palms that look very similar. One on my, on my right, my right hand is the Alexandra palm which is actually introduced, it grows in central to north Queensland. And on my left I have the Bangalow palm. So superficially they look very similar but you can see the difference in the undersides of the fronds. The Alexandra palm is quite grey whereas the um, Bangalow palm is quite green. So we remove the Alexandra palm and I'll demonstrate how we do that. This is called the cut and paint method. So we get as close to the base of the plant as we can and we cut through it like this. Then within a short time, ideally within 10 seconds, we then pour 100% roundup around the cut base as thoroughly as we can and that will kill the palm. That part won't grow again so we can just dispose of that in the bush itself. We'll pile it with other weeds which we may be composting. So we call that the cut and paint method. So here we have the seedling of camphor laurel. Uh, Rex was mentioning earlier that we hand remove a lot of the weeds. When we find a seedling of this size, we can hand remove this. Now we remove camphor laurel because it's, it grows into a large tree and competes with a lot of the, um, the rainforest vegetation in the, in the reserves around Port Macquarie. Unfortunately, it's spread by our native pigeons. They eat the um, fruits of this and spread the seeds. So when they're at this stage, we can remove them quite easily. So we, we grab it as close to the base as possible and it should come out fairly readily. Which that one has. Here we have one of our most common weeds in the uh, bushland and most of uh, northern New South Wales and into Queensland. It's called Lantana. Uh, it can occupy large areas of disturbed ground in, in, in forests um, to the exclusion of many other native species. Now next to it growing is a native raspberry and if you look at the uh, difference in the leaves they have a similar texture but you can see the raspberry has lobed leaves and produces berries which are, are edible but um, some people are concerned sometimes that the lantana actually provides um, refuge and nesting for native animals but if we get rid of the lantana it allows plants like these native raspberries to re-establish and they can occupy the same sort of niche and provide the same sort of shelter to those animals. Uh, so in the, in the sort of medium to longer term we are 
replacing that habitat for those animals. Now to remove the lantana we also use the cut and paint method. Um, with a plant this size we can use secateurs. So again we cut as close to the base as we can. And we put, apply the glyphosate to the cut stump as quickly as we can after cutting. Now with the lantana, it is best not to just leave it on the ground because it can re-root. It's best to put it in a pile of other weeds or debris we find so that it just rots away in a situation like that. We often call that a raft of weeds which will uh, compost themselves and not re-establish in the environment. Here we have a tree of Camper laurel. Recall we um, early we just pulled one out of the ground. Well, this is a bit impossible to do that too. So we have another method called frilling and painting. Now frilling requires putting a number of cuts around the base of the tree and again applying 100% glyphosate. So I'll demonstrate how we do that. You can either use or any good cutting implement. In this case I'm using a hand saw, but you can use an axe or a small chainsaw or you can drill holes into the tree. So I'll demonstrate the frilling method. What we do here is we cut a series of cuts around the trunk, but we don't ring bark the trunk. We leave a space between each cut so the poison that we apply can go up and down the trunk of the tree. So this is what we tend to do. So a series of cuts and then apply the glyphosate. We try to keep them reasonably close together but not, not joining. And we continue to do that around the whole tree. All right, so uh, earlier, I mentioned uh, the term priority weeds and that refers to the fact that we have different priorities when it comes to getting rid of weeds uh, and they that means that so certain weeds are in the very early stages of becoming weedy throughout our bushland uh, and they're the ones that we want to target first. So far some of the weeds we looked at can be considered widespread weeds and it is important to get rid of those. But research has shown that if you focus on the rarer or the newer weeds, you um, gain large benefit because you prevent them from becoming further established in the environment. So we've got one here, which is um, Chinese Celtis. Uh, this is a um, containment priority weed in our region, which means we must contain the spread of the weed and move towards eradication. So this comes from, it might be an old planting in people's gardens, it can be quite a large tree, uh, and then it produces fruit which is then spread by birds into bushland such as this. Um, so it's good to find weeds like this and uh, important to get proper identification, especially if it's a weed that you don't see very often and then uh, we can simply remove this, uh, probably we'll use the cut and paint technique like we've shown before. Right, uh, so we're out here on the farm with Leone, uh, property owner today, and um, we're going to talk about um, weed management on properties. Um, so Leone's got a good technique that she uses for lantana, um, so you can tell us a bit about Ah. Yeah, when we first arrived I used to pull it all up by hand or else lay your back into it and drag it out yep. and uh, then I started cutting and painting and then I came to the big hedges of lantana and thought this is ridiculous. So I was over on Lord Howe Island with the friends of Lord Howe weeding mm. over there and Hank and Sue Bauer um, told me about the splatter gun technique yep. and they gave me a fact sheet on it. So I thought, that sounds great. So um, we dug around in my mother-in-law's shed and found an old sheep drench gun. 
Um, it takes five litres of material, and I thought, well, that would probably be perfect for uh, splatter gunning. Yeah. So you put your protective equipment on. Uh, the mix that we use is seven to one. So being five litres, um, I usually, this is glyphosate, 360 gram. And being five litres, I usually mix up uh, about 600 mils and then times by seven, you get 4.2 litres of water. And that's close enough yep. to um, five litres because if you fill it to the top, it dribbles down your back. <laughs> yeah. So we just pop that in there. Now there are um, gas powered splatter guns that you can buy, um, which use a small gas cylinder to charge the gun. Um, you can also use a backpack sprayer um, just on a stream setting uh, and with quite high pressure as well. And you can see from the foam that it has a surfactant in it which helps it stick to the leaves so it's like a detergent. I also use um, tank water rather than dam water because the dam water has impurities in it that will eventually clog up your spray gun or in this case your splatter gun. Mm. And the herbicide will bind to soil particles so any um, soil contamination in the water can render the herbicide um, uh, less useful. There we go. Now we're ready to go and split it. Great. So we're standing in an area that was once full of lantana and we can see it dying off here. It looks pretty good. Um, how long ago was this done? Oh, this um, property here, we've got 60 acres of forest. Now it was managed for timber production. And so this was an old log dump that was completely covered in a wall mm -hmm. of lantana, much like you see behind me here. This lot that's dying now, I splatter gunned that about six weeks ago, and it gradually yellows and dies, and then all that mass that you see there will eventually collapse down. Yeah. I only do it like one level at a time, and then I'll leave it for a couple of years. And that allows all the little small creatures and things that live underneath it to find a new home. And it also stops um, shock of your, your big open areas and uh, it doesn't let the weeds come back in. So if you like, I'll demonstrate. Yes, great. Gun. So while this has already been done for demonstration purposes, um, I've loaded up the drench gun with the concentrate and I literally just go like that move two paces, go like that, move two paces, go like that, and that entire bank's done. So while you have a, quite a lot of herbicide in your gun, uh, you don't use very much at all. And you can, yeah, you can get quite away with that. It, it went up, you can see where it's gone up to, mm. and there's more hedges beyond that, which I'll do in two years time. I won't knock myself out about it. <laughs> Great, and that is a really good point um, in terms of biosecurity and our biosecurity duty. Lantana, whilst we all know it and we all want to get rid of it, it is a widespread weed. And there, as Leonie said, there isn't a need to knock yourself out getting rid of everything, but to have at least a plan and to work slowly on that plan and then slowly reduce that amount of lantana and that is enough to fulfill your duty uh, and it gets great results. Okay, um, Leonie, so other weeds that um, property owners regularly deal with is pasture weeds like 
giant Parramatta grass, fireweed, and things like that. Um, you seem to have some pretty weed-free paddocks, generally. Um, how have you gone about approaching and tackling these um, weeds? Well, we used to break up back when we first came here and we looked at the enemy and we thought, right, we'll just dig it out with mattocks. But that just didn't seem to work because as yep. you can see, there's millions of little seeds on these seed heads and they just lie in the ground waiting for you to dig it up. So um, we went to a presentation with Judy Earle and she said, stop concentrating on what you want less of and start concentrating on what you want more of. Mm. So we turned a blind eye to the Parramatta grass and we uh, decided to outcompete it by building the, uh, the proper structure for the soil mm. and the fertility of the soil and getting the chemistry right and then overcrowding the Parramatta grass with other crops yeah. uh, of things that we did want in particular legumes and more recently we've been trying brassicas yeah so um, the other thing we did is underneath our fence lines uh, they had always been sprayed and we found that was where you just got the most weeds so we went along and we hand pulled all the weeds out from under the fence lines mm. and now the cattle do the job for us and eat the grass so we don't have to keep slashing the fence lines to keep the power in the fences mm -hmm. and we don't have the weed problem along the fence lines. And you've raised the lower um, lower wire of the fence slightly up? Yeah, so in those new fences the wire is raised up so the cows can get their heads underneath and eat the grass and that way we don't have to poison the fence lines so yeah. then you don't get more weeds. Fantastic. We also tried um, the Nigrospora spray Yes. Uh, which is something that cre creates crown rot. Um, it was called paratrooper, but I think it's called something different now. Um, and it does work to a certain extent. So under the right weather conditions, where you've got warm, moist weather, that fungus actually multiplies and it kills off the Parramatta grass. You'll see it turning orange in patches in the mm -hmm. paddock. Yep. It's not a complete eradication, but it's another thing in your arsenal. Yeah, another tool. Yeah. Yeah, great. We've got here uh, another of our priority weeds on the north coast. This is Chinese tallow tree, or Triatica sibifera. Um, you can see, obviously, it's deciduous and they're going yellow for the winter. Uh, now, this is an example of uh, another weed that was previously sold, a very good and popular landscaping tree. Um, but we've started to see on the north coast, uh, it's been observed that this Chinese tallow has been spreading, uh, particularly down waterways uh, and into natural areas, and it started to germinate really prolifically. So unfortunately, what happens often is that um, the weed then, the tree then gets assessed uh, they determine how much it's spreading, how dangerous it could be, and ultimately it gets labelled a weed and uh, ranked with a priority. So consequently it's not sold on the north coast anymore through nurseries. Uh, and as a responsible land manager, council now will um, have to remove this row of trees. So you might find that you've got some Chinese tallows on your property. Um, they grow quite a large tree. So if you do, give us a call here at Council and uh, we can come and help you to, um, to deal with that for the future. Right, um, well, we're here in Warhope uh, with Steve from Hastings Landcare. G'day Steve. G'day, how are you? Good, good. Um, so can you tell us a bit about Hastings Landcare and um, the network and uh, the good work that they do? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, Landcare is a big part of uh, the Hastings area. We have a number of groups um, across the Hastings region um, and not a day goes by without uh, Landcare work in, our, in the Hastings region. Uh, there's groups down in, across the region uh, working nearly every day of the week. So Dunbogan Bush Care, for example, they work on a Monday. Uh, we've got Port Macquarie Land Care Nursery open on a Monday as well. Um, they also work 
uh, on Tuesdays and during the weekend as well. Uh, you've got Lake Cadai on, on Wednesday, so uh, and Warhope on Thursday, and there's plenty. There's also Camden Haven Land Care Group, um, Bonnie Hills Land Care Group, uh, Lake Cadai Land Care, and they all do amazing things um, throughout the throughout the week. And uh, on top of that, there's plenty of private landholders out there doing work on their own properties. Uh, uh, weed control um, and uh, e um, restoration work throughout their properties as well. So, Great. yeah, basically, uh, yeah, yeah, not a day goes by without land care activities. Um, and these activities could be weed control, planting, uh, erosion control, uh, education. A lot of groups do work with school groups, um, workshops. Um, yeah, so there's plenty of uh, land care activities um, constantly uh, through the Hastings region. Fantastic, yeah. yeah. And um, what about some of the work that you do um, with landholders who might call up asking for advice? Uh, yeah, so so we're based in at Warhope um, on Cameron Street, oh, Warhope. And Fantastic. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, yeah, so we're based in at Warho at Cameron Street, so we get a lot of people um, coming in and um, asking lots of questions. Um, and weed control is um, is a pretty common one. So we help with uh, a weed ID. So if you've got a weed that you're not sure about, um, you could bring it in, or you could. Uh, email a photo or send a photo um, to my phone and we can help you find out what it is and what to do about it. We also, I also go out and um, have a look at properties. You, a lot of new landholders come in and, and have a chat and I'll go out and uh, have a look around and uh, if there's any weeds that, um, that they might not know about or plants or any issues they might not know about I can um, help out and, and maybe um, point them into a right direction on what strategies to use to, uh, you know, to, to make the best way forward the, 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 um, to manage that weed most effectively. So, mm. yeah, so, so we do that. Plus we've got plenty of um, resources like weed ID books and uh, river restoration guides uh, to help out with as well, plant species lists, so yeah. Uh, all that sort of stuff. Mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great point, Steve. Um, so there are plenty of resources out there. Um, not only land care, you've got myself at council, uh, local land services uh, and commercial agronomists can all help people with um, various uh, weed control and uh, restoration uh, advice on their properties. Um, so I know we've had some good partnerships uh, between council and land Yeah, care. definitely. So uh, this year, um, yeah, Hastings Lanker applied for a um, community grant, um, and we got um, we were successful with that grant, and uh, we managed to get some new shirts um, and PPE gloves um, and some equipment for three new groups that have established. Um, the okay. Comboyne Land Care Group, the King Creek Land Care Group and the Warhope Land Care Group. So they're all established and up and running again um, now as well. Um, so that, that was a great help to Land Care. And also we uh, ran the um, uh, community based weeds project, which council um, was a big part in helping us get that together and that was uh, the control of high, the high priority weed, the Cotspur coral tree and we approached landholders that had this tree and, um, and, and let them know the issues with the tree and why it, why it is a problem and, and, how, and how to go about controlling it and then we actually went on there and um, controlled uh, the, the trees for them and there was 12 landholders that were involved with that project um, 
and that was a great result for the, the cashman because we just don't have many of those trees at all um, and getting rid of them now will prevent them spreading um, you know further and quicker and um, becoming like a like a camper laurel or something uh, where, where they're just widespread so yeah. and the other good thing about that project is uh, many of the landholders didn't know that that was a weed and um, and there was a, just a di really diverse um, range of landholders so um, yeah there was you know, new farmers farmers that have been on the property for a number number of years um, there were there was a large company as well mm. uh, there were yeah multiple different types of landholders that all were willing to help and support uh, that program um, to you know keep our waterways and our environment healthy yeah so, yeah yep, fantastic um, and yeah we'll look to continue projects like this in the future yeah, definitely. and um, Landcare is a great partner in addressing biosecurity issues in our region. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about land care or finding a, a local group uh, or a group that's doing something you're interested in, uh, please yeah, feel free to contact uh, me at Hastings Land Care. Um, we've got our website, you can um, contact us through that or um, yeah, please give us a call or email and um, yeah, we can point you in the right direction or you have any questions about land care yeah just uh, contact us and uh, let me know right so we're um, we've got a bit of a bad patch here that we're dealing with and are not quite a number of weeds so if you've got a bit of a neglected area of your property you might find something like this um, so we've got a few weeds here we've obviously got our lantana coming out uh, white passion fruit vine grows quite prolifically. Unfortunately, they're not edible. Um, wild tobacco tree, which you notice a lot of around this area. Um, senna or cassia, which gets quite large yellow flowers and these bean-like pods. Uh, castor oil plant, another grows very quickly. Um, these are all examples of fairly common weeds. They're pretty widespread in our area uh, and we just need to work on them bit by bit. Um, but we've got another one here which is our priority at the moment, which is cockspur coral tree. You can see we're standing in front of quite a large one here. Um, now this was one that Steve from Landcare mentioned, was part of a partnership program between Council and Landcare, because currently it is quite limited in its distribution in the Hastings area. Um, the reason it's such a bad weed is that the timber is very light and very brittle. It breaks off quickly. It likes to grow in wet, damp areas those branches fall to the ground, they quickly take root, they grow into another tree, and so on and so on and so on. As we've got in this small creek system, Coxburg coral tree has grown and progressed all the way down the river and it's now almost at the uh, junction with the Hastings River. So we have a potential weed that can, um, that could have a much larger outbreak if it gets onto the Hastings River. So this is just an example. If you've got weeds like this on your property uh, or plants that you have trouble identifying, give us a call at council and we're more than happy to come and help you identify and prioritise your weeds and make it easy for you to um, put control measures in place. Hello to the landholders of the Port Macquarie Hastings Council area. Thanks for tuning into this video. I hope you can learn some useful biosecurity tips from both Council and our staff here at Local Land Services. Before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we are all on today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. My name is Ella Rasmussen and I work with North Coast Local Land Services on a project called the Every Bit Counts project. 
Also joining us from LLS today will be Donna Cuthall, who is our Plant Biosecurity Officer. She'll be giving us an overview of good biosecurity practices for your property and also talk about two particular plant pests to keep an eye out for. Also joining us is Mick Elliott, who will talk about invasive pests in the Port Macquarie area, such as wild dogs and deer. Some of you might have heard of local land services before and some of you might not have. LLS is an agency that is spread right across regional New South Wales and on top of running some amazing projects that generally work towards restoring natural landscapes, we provide advice to landholders on a number of topics from pasture management, to animal health, vegetation management and of course biosecurity. A lot of our landholders are actually larger properties. If your land is over 10 hectares in size, you would likely pay local land services rates and this covers off on those services. So that brings me to the Every Bit Counts project. Small landholders make up a huge portion of coastal areas of New South Wales. Just on the north coast alone, we have over 17,000 pieces of private land that are between two and 20 hectares in size. This map here really puts it into perspective and shows the distribution across our region. Every Bit Counts is a new project that is being piloted in four coastal LLS regions. So here on the north coast, in the Hunter region, the Greater Sydney region and the Southeast region. It's about developing resources and delivering information to small landholders such as yourselves in these areas. It recognises the diverse use of land in these sized properties and also the environmental outcomes that collectively they contribute to. Every bit does count. These small landholders such as yourself are often called peri-urban and properties this size are often in amongst urban blocks as well as large producing farms. It's this reason that connectivity between these properties is so important and also why biosecurity is so important. It doesn't matter if you're bringing in plants for your garden or hay for your livestock, the same biosecurity risks exist regardless of your property size. So you might live next door to a large producer who would be greatly affected or you might be adjoining a national park. It's really important that all landholders, regardless of property size, understand biosecurity risks and how to help out. The Every Bit Counts project is building in our region and we're continually developing a program of information sessions, workshops, field days for small landholders in the North Coast region. We're also keen to hear what issues you're all facing on your small blocks of land. So it would be really great if you wanted to join up on our newsletter and be informed of any upcoming events and useful resources on all things land management. It's also a great opportunity to connect with like-minded people in similar positions to yourselves. So to join our network, head to the LLS website. Um, it's best if you Google or search LLS Every Bit Counts and it should come up. If you click on the North Coast link, it will take you through to a subscription form. So before I hand over to my colleagues, Donna and Mick, I want to quickly talk about a really exciting new initiative called the Perry Urban Environmental Biosecurity Network. It's a bit, a bit of a mouthful, so it's shortened to the PEBN network. This network provides a platform where small landholders can access expert knowledge on emerging or important biosecurity issues. Experts will provide advice and tools on how to look for, manage and report unusual non-native pests and diseases. These include exotic animals such as cane toads and red-eared slider turtles and insects such as, as fire ants, exotic bees and brown mum raided stink bugs that if allowed to establish in New South Wales, will have serious impacts on the lifestyles that we currently enjoy. Through building this capacity in our network, it hopes to empower small landholders like yourselves to help spread knowledge about biosecurity and improve community awareness and participation in general surveillance of environmental biosecurity risks. That is keeping an eye out for unusual animals, insects, or new signs of pests and diseases and reporting them. In turn, this will contribute to a healthier environment. environment. So how can you get involved? If you're part of the, the peri-urban community, look out for articles on the web page and follow the Facebook page. You'll learn how to identify biosecurity threats in your area and you'll be able to take part in surveillance and reporting activities. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoy learning more about biosecurity in the Port Macquarie area from my colleagues. Thank you. Good afternoon everybody, uh, my name is Donna Cuthall and I'm the Plant Biosecurity Officer with North Coast Local Land Services. Uh, today we're going to have a chat uh, about biosecurity for small landholders and I'd also have included um, two pests that are, I think are heading our way from Queensland 
um, and I'd like you to keep an eye out for those. So we'll start out with the um, biosecurity stuff and move on to the first section. So biosecurity, what does it mean? In the agricultural and land ownership um, area, it's actually protecting the economy, environment and community from the negative impacts of pests, diseases, weeds and contaminants. Owners of small land holdings play an important part in keeping Australia's agricultural industries free from the impacts of these pests and diseases. So practicing good biosecurity means taking action to protect your hobby farm or small land holding from the above negative impacts. Why is it important? Being biosecure could help you keep your animals safe from disease, grow more produce and reduce the impacts of pests, diseases and weeds on your property, and help our primary producers gain better yields at lower cost, all the while maintaining access to interstate and international markets. How can you help? Everyday farming and gardening practices are all part of being biosecure. Some of these practices may include preventing the spread of pests and diseases by checking materials and machinery when they enter and leave your property for unwanted hitchhikers. Come clean, go clean. Checking feed out areas for signs of unusual insect infestations or weeds. Educating farm visitors on the importance of biosecurity on your property and having an emergency disease action plan or a farm biosecurity plan. And if any of you are needing help with a biosecurity plan, uh, please give me a call because I'd be more than happy to help you out. There's a few things that you also need to be aware of. Uh, there are certain actions a small uh, landholder or hobby farmer must legally take to be biosecure. These are detailed in the, bios in the Biosecurity Act 2015, and they have some uh, supporting legislation that's attached. The laws cover things that are likely to have the biggest impact on our economy, environment or community and include rules around high risk and priority pests and diseases that must be reported. These can also be known as notifiable pests and diseases, prohibited matter and biosecurity events. Controlling the movement, treatment and importation of plants, so moving uh, plants into between states or possibly even buying uh, plants from overseas. Having the right accreditation, registration, certificates and permits that are also appropriate to your business or land holding. Okay, so now we're going to uh, move on to the pest section. And the first one that I'd like to talk about are red imported fire ants. Um, Biosecurity Queensland have put together this uh, great little video that I'd like to share with you that pretty much uh, runs through how they got here um, what they look like and um, what we can do when we're looking for them. So I'll just share that with you now. Fire ants are an invasive ant species. Uh, they come from the Pantanal region in South America and they're really good hitchhikers. So they made their way to the US probably in the 1930s in ships ballast. And from there they've spread out to 17 states in the US affecting something like 70 million people. They've also spread to China, to Taiwan, and also to the Caribbean. And in 2001, we found them in Brisbane in Australia. They're a super pest. They'll affect human health and lifestyle. They'll eat our crops, they'll sting our livestock, they'll damage our infrastructure, they'll reduce biodiversity. They're going to cost our economy. In the United States, the damage there is about $7 billion a year. If you're looking for fire ants in a residential block, you'd probably find them on lawns, garden beds, on footpaths, you'd find them near taps, and you'd find them in utility pits. If you're in rural areas, then you would tend to look for them alongside dams or irrigation lines. You find them under fence lines, on the edges of cropland, sometimes in cropland, and in piles of organic matter such as hay or mulch. In appearance, they're coppery brown in colour. They have a darker abdomen and they range in sizes from about two millimetres to six millimetres. The nest itself is usually a mound. And the thing that makes their mounds a little bit different to native ants is that they've got no entrance or exit holes. The first thing to remember is that fire ants 
are dangerous. They can hospitalise you, they can kill you. So don't go poking a fire ant's nest with your finger or attempt to kick it with your foot uh, because they'll run out very, very quickly and start to sting. It's probably best to just poke them gently with a stick and observe what happens. Okay, so um, next we're actually going to move on to a thing called forearming worm. Now, this was found in at the top of Queensland at the, at the end of January in 2020, uh, and unfortunately has moved down and is currently sitting somewhere just around Funderburg. The fall armyworm is a new plant pest present in Queensland, but not yet detected in New South Wales. The insect has a host range of some 350 plant species and is a serious threat to Australia's grain, rice, cotton, horticultural and sugar industries. Fall armyworm damage in crops has similar symptoms to that caused by other larvae or other common armyworm that you may have already seen. Adult fall armyworm moths are strong flyers and will travel hundreds of kilometres on storm fronts. The larvae can also be spread in cut flowers, fruits and vegetable consignments. We've just completed a webinar on fall armyworm and the recording can be watched by clicking on the link below. We also have a full trapping program surveillance trapping program in the north of New South Wales. So we've got 15 sites uh, with 30 traps, all monitoring to sort of make sure that we know once it lands in New South Wales. So they're the two uh, insects that are, or the two pests that I think um, are likely to come our way in the not too distant future and something that it would be great if everybody could be on the lookout for. So what happens if you do see anything? It doesn't have to be fall armyworm or uh, red imported fire ants. Anything that you see in your backyard that you think possibly wasn't there before, something that um, is unusual or unexpected um, and you think that we might need to know, there's a few different ways that you can actually contact us. So you can report notifiable plant pests and diseases by calling the exotic plant pest hotline, emailing biosecurity at dpi, .nsw.gov.au. You can complete an online form by clicking uh, that link there, or you can contact uh, your local land services office on 1300 795 299. And at any point in time, um, my details are on the front page. Please be, don't hesitate to give me a call. So I guess if there's something that I would like for you guys to take away um, from our session this afternoon is it's that biosecurity is everybody's business. We all have a role to play in protecting New South Wales from exotic plant pests and diseases. And the smallest things that you can do on your farm could have massive impacts, you know, to your next door neighbour or to their next door neighbour. So uh, thanks very much for watching and um, hopefully I'll talk to you soon. Pest animals, they're present in rural, peri-urban and urban areas. They cause significant damage to the environment, economy, community and livelihood, and indeed the mental health of affected landholders. My name's Mick Elliott, and I'm a biosecurity officer with North Coast Local Land Services. I'd like to share some information with you today regarding the management of pest animals in our area, what you can do, who can assist you, and how you can help when you see pest animals their signs or suffer from their impacts. North Coast Local Land Services collects rates from landholders owning land of 10 hectares or more. And one of the services we offer is advice and assistance to landholders with the management of pest animals. It's important to remember that under the Biosecurity Act, we all have a duty to ensure that a biosecurity risk is prevented, eliminated or minimised. And given that pest animals have absolutely no regard as to the size of the land they're moving on, we at North Coast Local Land Services endeavour to work closely with other government, semi-government, councils, national parks, RMS and community groups to offer expertise in pest animal management. It's critical that everyone, government, industry and all landholders work together to protect the economy, environment and community of New South Wales 
from the negative impacts of pest animals. On council managed land, your first contact should always be with an environmental officer or ranger at your local council. And if necessary, they may well ask for assistance from local land services. So what pest animals are we talking about? These are some of the pest animals you may see, or more importantly, notice the impacts of in or around your holding. Let's run through some of the most, uh, a few of the most important points for each pest. Wild dogs certainly have moved into peri-urban and urban areas. They're proving to be highly adaptable. They'll make the, the area their own. They can have a major impact on fragmented wildlife refuges and wildlife corridors where they see the, the efforts that have gone into plant vegetation to attract our natives, they see as, as a prey um, option and availability. Most people tend to underestimate the numbers of wild dogs out there and management has to take that into effect. They have a huge impact on domestic pets. We are seeing an increase of that. So domestic dogs are seen as uh, rivals and, and a threat and are quite often attacked. We also see some people feeding wild dogs and although they think they're doing the right thing and presuming that they're strays, these dogs can then, when are not fed, can confront other people because they're not being fed. Some of the signs of wild dogs may well include howling, usually of a night time, tracks and scats, and also things like kangaroos and wallabies acting disturbed and camping in the middle of a paddock on a hot day. They don't necessarily want to be there, it's more that they can't get back into the forest where the wild dogs are operating. Feral deer. We're seeing an increase of feral deer in our area. They compete with livestock for resources, food and water. They can damage horticulture and trample environmentally sensitive areas. They can impact water quality through erosion, wallowing and their faecal contamination and are a significant road safety threat. We see a number of road accidents each year uh, involving feral deer. And uh, they can also obviously have a, a, an impact and damage urban areas, gardens and lawn areas. Under any sort of management threat, uh, feral deer can op adopt a cryptic behaviour, which means they become very elusive and work of a night time. So you may only see their impacts after they've already been through. So look for browse plants, scats and prints. They certainly are, are um, really hard on the waterways. They compete with other native herbivores. And uh, one of the comments that we've heard is that they're lovely until they're not. So if there's three or four around, they're lovely. But as their numbers increase, that changes. Foxes are another animal that move into these peri-urban areas. They love to live on creek lines, so look for their dens around creek lines. They prey on birds and reptiles, certainly our chooks that we have in our backyard, small mammals, lambs and waterfowl. They have a huge impact on native wildlife. And some of the things that you would look for to see whether you have foxes, to notice whether you have foxes, are visible sightings, obviously, missing or dead animals, fox species, uh, prints and their dens. Rabbits. Uh, we most, most of us are aware of rabbits and their effect. That list there shows you what, uh, what the impact of one pair can have over a 12-month period. So it's not un unlikely to see over 300 pairs um, result from that one pair. So that tells us to act straight away. If you see a couple of rabbits, the potential is there for a lot more. So the time to act is now. Feral cats, we're getting a lot more calls about feral cats now. And um, as we all know, they can occupy most habitats. They're a, a, an extremely good hunter and they have a significant, they're a significant predator of mammals and birds and reptiles. And although our management options are limited with cats, um, we've certainly got, um, there's a number of research projects going at the moment that hopefully will, will offer us more management options. Feral pigs, you may well see their damage. Uh, they are significant uh, damages of crops, pasture and fencing and creek lines. Um, they create soil disturbance, order the drainage. They can increase turbidity and sedimentation in our, in our waterways 
and assist with the spread of weeds. They're also a potential host of exotic disease and um, carry parasites that can affect stock and pose a disease risk to humans. Cane toads. Cane toads are, um, we've had a number of incursions in our local area. Certainly um, they're a threat to our domestic pets and livestock and to other threatened species. And normally, funnily enough, are moved by people in pot plants, mulch, soil, and also in work boots that have been left outside. We should be looking to minimise or eliminate the impacts of cane toads and try and prevent their spread into other parts of New South Wales. So what are our management options? Reporting is one of the major things that we should start with. It, let other, it lets others know where pest animals are and you can report them to LLS, uh, to Feral Scan, which is a free community-based resource that can be used by anyone to record pest animal activity, to show activity, damage, and, and, and indeed control. Your local council will also accept reporting of pest animals. Um, once we've reported, what's next? Well, then we can look at the real, the other management options that we have. That could include cage traps, soft jaw foothold traps, and camera traps. Uh, camera traps are a great assistance to us that tells the story. So what time are the animals moving, how many, and how often. That assists us with the options and advice that we will give. That advice could well include uh, baiting, and for that you need a chemical card, and we provide free vertebrate pesticide training, uh, and you can contact your local, uh, local land services and we can um, advise you when that training can take place. In any management, it's important to make use of all legal control methods. We need to make that control method proactive, strategic and targeted. We know that the best result comes when a community owns the issue. So that means talking to your neighbours, mobilise so that everyone's on the same page. It also involves all stakeholders. So that includes government agencies and, and um, any of the public groups that are around that are interested in, in this pest animal management. We, we try to involve all of those. An acceptance that the issue will be ongoing. So once we accept that, we can move through that it might, we may well have to do this again. Patience is the key. We need to forget the E word, forget eradication, and for the time being, accept M word, management. Let's management, let's manage those pest animals and try to get the impacts down. In most cases, there are only a limited number of legal control methods available to us. In the case of wild dogs, it really is only, we can use baits, we can use traps, or we can use firearms, with other options of exclusion fencing and protection animals. If for any reason you exclude one method, you are obviously limiting your management options. When we talk about proactive, strategic and targeted, we mean proactive when you know it's about that time, so before you've had impacts. If you can, if you can take some management options before a wild dog moves into your paddock and creates impacts, you're in a much better position for proper management. Strategic is, is at that time of the year when the pest is vulnerable. For wild dogs, there's three, there's three of those times. Early in the year, which is mating season, mid-year, which is when whelping occurs, and towards the end of the year when you have younger dogs moving around. And targeted is those areas where you know the pest is moving and at those times when, it, when it's moving. There's no doubt that the absolute best results that we see in pest animal management are a product of community ownership, with everyone doing their share and taking their share of the problem of pest animal impacts, which are then vastly reduced. No one's gonna fix your problem for you without help. Be prepared to get involved. Once you accept that the issue is ongoing, you are opening up to the possibility that you will have to deal with this again. So it gets on the calendar. And so you're better prepared when it is required. For example, if you were to discover that some, for some reason you have a great place for feral deer to feed, 
Just because you moved them on last year doesn't mean the problem's solved. And it doesn't mean that others won't find your place just as attractive this year. And remember, patience is the key, especially with regarding to trapping. Listen to the advice given and be prepared to ask questions. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you've found some of the information worthwhile. For more information, please ring your local land service office. Thank you.